everybody. My name is Jesse and I'm your virtual adventure guide here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Now, I know we've got a big new audience today. And so if you are joining us for the very first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, last year, we did about 520 programs featuring conservationists, scientists, explorers around the planet, and we are uh, capstoning our second week. We've hung out with wildlife filmmakers from National Geographic, outreach scientists from the James Webb Space Telescope, and adventurers that have run across America and rode the Pacific Ocean as one does. So it's been a really, really fun time. And so thank you all so much for being here, especially if it's your first time. Now, today I'm particularly excited to dive in because in 2014, I visited Newfoundland. This is a place that I had never thought about going to in my entire life uh, up until that point. And so I went with my family. And we went to the West Coast, which has a beautiful, beautiful park called Gros Morne. I think it's the gem of Canada's national park system. And in Gros Morne, there's the Bon Bay Marine Station, this awesome aquarium where you get the chance to interact with animals that have literally been drawn right from the bay, right into the aquarium, so people can learn about the incredible wildlife off one of the Canada's wildest coasts. And this is such a formative experience for me that I moved to Newfoundland. I'm, I'm joining you live from the west coast of Newfoundland in Cornerbrook with my fiance. And so I'm so excited this year to start diving in and sharing more stories from this really unique and special part of the world with classrooms like you. So. To that end, this is our first such program from the province, uh, and I'm so excited that you guys are all joining us as we dive in with the Bond Bay Marine Station and Willa, their lead educator and interpreter, who's going to take us on a little bit of a journey of their touch tanks and all the amazing stuff found on their coast. So without further ado, Willa, thank you so much for joining us today, and take us away. <laughs> thank you for the intro. Yeah, so I'm here right now at the Bombay Aquarium and Research Station in Norris Point, which is in the heart of Gross Morne, a huge national park, which makes it a really unique place to study um, marine life, biodiversity, and everything like that. Um, normally, looking out these two windows here that I can see out of, I'd be able to see the two arms of Bombay, the east arm and the south arm. But right now, we're actually in a bit of a hurricane, so all I can see is gray. But those two arms are what make um, Bombay such a unique place. They have two different depths, um, the east arm being much deeper. It's so deep that it actually has species trapped, Arctic species trapped in there that haven't been able to escape since glaciers carved out this bay 15,000 years ago. Um, and the two arms are separated by a sill, which is what is trapping those species there. And we're also keeping um, bigger species, whale species that we see in the bay from traveling into the east arm here. Um, but my favorite part of the bay here is the intertidal area, um, and we showcase that here in our aquarium and our touch tanks, which you can actually see just here behind me. Um, I'm kind of in a remote, kind of smaller setup today, so I can talk to you guys. Um, normally, we do have the two touch tanks there, and we use two touch tanks to kind of represent two different habitats that we see in the intertidal zone. One of those being a rocky bottom, um, so creatures are able to hide in crevices and cracks in the rocks, and things like starfish are able to hold on to rocks with those um, suction cups that they have for security. And then in a sandy environment, uh, we have creatures that like to bury themselves down under the sand a lot of the time. Um, and they do this because in the intertidal zone, creatures have to be really, really tough to survive. Um, the water in the intertidal zone goes down below, um, exposing all these creatures to the atmosphere. And obviously marine creatures for the most part, they need to be underwater to survive. So a lot of the creatures we're gonna be looking at today have adaptations that they use to hold onto their moisture um, and keep themselves from desiccating or drying out when they are exposed to the atmosphere at low tide. Um, so we'll start jumping in. So I have a bunch of these creatures right here in front of me in a little in a little bin. I'm seeing a lot going on right now. I've already had to break up a couple of crab fights. Um, but yeah, we'll start jumping in. Um, so we can start with ones that most people are familiar with. And um, in the animal kingdom, um, things are often grouped in families. Um, so as species, they'll be grouped in a family together, and that's usually done to help us identify things. Um, so the first family we can look at today are called echinoderms, which literally means spiny skin when translated. So that will kind of cover a lot of the creatures we're most familiar with, such as sea stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, things like that. And you can 
we'll be able to see why they are all classified together as those spiny skin individuals. And when creatures are all in a family together, we often refer to them as cousins in the animal kingdom. So well, they're not actually um, related like that, um, as species, they're kind of closely related. So we can start looking at some of these guys. Um, everyone's favorite are usually the sea stars. So we can start off on a, on a high note. Um, so we have a couple different sea stars that we see in Bombay here. And this first guy is called the Northern Common Sea Star. You can see he's one of the bigger ones we have around here and the most common, hence his name, Common Sea Star, and he loves the cold water and it's Northern in his name. Um, so all their names are pretty self-explanatory. Um, but when I flip him over on his back here and we look at his underside, you guys, I'm sorry, you won't be able to see so well, but he has all of these little tube feet. You can see them a little bit. So these are like little suction cups, or it used to be thought that they were like suction cups that he'll use to stick onto rocks and walk around. Um, but now it's actually more thought that they use an adhesive. They'll secrete a little adhesive, almost like glue through this little suction cup here. And that's what they'll use to kind of stick onto things and move around. Um, they also use these for feeding. Um, he has a mouth right here in his center, which he actually has pushed out a little bit right now, which is super cool. Unfortunately, not that easy to see. Um, and maybe if I move it up a bit closer without getting my, yeah, you can see it there. So, oh, that's his mouth right there. Um, so he'll use these two feet um, when he wants to eat to kind of pry open anything he wants to eat, specifically mussels. This is a blue mussel here. It's one of his favorite foods. Um, so he'll pry that open with those little sticky feet and what he'll do actually is out of that mouth I just showed you, he will push his stomach out of his body, which is just such a crazy thing to witness. Um, but they have two stomachs in their body, which is super unique. One is called a pyloric stomach and one is called a cardiac stomach. And when he wants to eat something, he'll push the cardiac stomach completely out of his mouth there. And it's like this big ball of jello, it's clear. So you can see usually the food inside his stomach when he's eating, which is just insane. Um, and then he'll kind of digest his food outside of his body in that stomach. And when he's all done, he'll pull his stomach back in as if nothing ever happened. It's really cool. Probably one of um, the most unique ways a creature in the, in the animal kingdom eats, in my opinion. Yeah, so one of the cousins of those guys, um, I'll be saying that quite a bit today since a lot of these guys are related, would be the sea urchin. So I'll pick him up now. So I'm sure people are pretty familiar with these guys too. It's kind of like a spiny ball. Everyone's usually scared to touch these guys, um, but I kind of compare them to like a hedgehog. Like it's pointy, but it's not really sharp. If I move them close, you'll be able to see those spines a bit better there. And these spines he has for a few different reasons. One of these reasons is, of course, protection. Nothing really wants to chomp into a ball of spines like this. It'd pretty, probably hurt quite a bit, if you can imagine, biting into this. Um, the only thing really um, that loves to eat these guys, other things will eat them if they're desperate, but the things that love to eat these guys are the wolf fish. Um, and it, that's a really important species in our ecosystem that I'll talk about a bit later. Um, so this guy is really cool as well. And the reason why um, he's related to the starfish, besides just um, the mouth on his underside, or sorry, the, um, the spiny skin, is because of the mouth on the underside. So I showed you um, the starfish's mouth on the underside there. And if we look really closely, you can see he has a mouth right there on his underside as well. And he actually has five little teeth in his mouth which is another reason why they're related. And if I can find something here, I have an example here of the five little teeth completely separated from the shell. So if I hold this right up to the camera, you'll be able to see five little teeth there. Um, and they would be pretty sharp. Um, and he is able to use those to kind of eat up seaweed. He's mainly a herbivore. Those are his kind of favorite foods to eat. Seaweed, sea grasses, things like that. Um, so the reason why that makes them related to starfish is because there's five of those. And then the starfish, of course, have five legs. Um, so all uh, animals in the echinoderm family have what's called pentaradial symmetry, which means five. Um, so five arms, five teeth. 
Another guy that we'd be pretty, pretty familiar with um, who is in the same family is the Sand Dollar. Um, oh, this is a live one here and it's kind of hard to see on him, but I also have a shell here and he has the flower pattern on him, which is pretty infamous with the five petals. So that's another reason why they're related as well as again, the mouth on the underside there. Um, so that's kind of another reason why they're all related there. So it's really neat to see um, how all these different characteristics of these creatures makes them closely related to one another and really easily identifiable for, for us scientists. Um, so lastly, in the echinoderm family, we have this guy here, which we don't normally have in our touch tanks. So you guys are pretty lucky that um, I have a note here and now. And this is the sea cucumber. And you can see it's pretty slimy there. There's some slime dripping off my hand, you can see there. And now he's squirting at water. Um, so yeah, this is one of the reasons we don't really keep them in the touch tank so much is they're a little sensitive. Um, so of course, it's not always great with little hands grabbing him all the time, but he's really neat. Um, pretty slimy, as I said before, and he has rows here on his body of those same tube feet again. So that's another characteristic that makes them all related. So the sea stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, and sea cucumbers are those four creatures, tube feet, Pentaradial radial symmetry and a mouth on their underside that kind of groups all those guys together. One guy that we have who a lot of people think um, is related to a sea cucumber um, is this little guy here. He's actually not related to a sea cucumber, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Right now, he's all closed up, um, so I'm able to pick him up, but this is actually a sea anemone. And I know many of you guys are from um, warmer areas. I think a few people from California and places like that. Um, so you might be familiar with these guys and you might be really familiar with um, a vibrant, colorful sea anemone. Um, I know Funny Nemo usually um, is what people think of when they hear sea anemone just because um, Nemo did live in a sea anemone um, with all his tentacles like that. And normally these guys would give off a, a pretty bad sting if you were to touch them. However, in our colder waters here in Newfoundland, another thing that's pretty unique, uh, many species that usually would um, give off a sting or, or anything like that, or like venom or poison, um, we don't see much of that here. And that's because in our colder waters, things have to use most of their energy just to focus on staying alive. Um, so they don't have much energy left over to focus on adaptations like um, stinging, venom, things like that. So that sea urchin we just saw too with the spines, um, in more tropical areas, there are kinds of him who would give off um, venom from those spines. But as you saw, I was able to pick him up, no problem. And if this guy was opened up with his tentacles moving around, I'd be able to touch those two, no problem, no sting to me whatsoever, um, which is really cool because you're able to kind of see creatures and explore them more up close than you'd normally be able to without fear of them harming you. Um, although really, um, you shouldn't really be too scared of them anyways, for the most part. Um, I watched a clip of one of the shark um, episodes that was earlier on this on this broadcast. And um, it's kind of similar to that. A lot of people have a bit of fear of the sharks, but really um, it's a bit, a bit of a misconception for sure. So yeah, this guy, the sea anemone is actually in the same family as the jellyfish. So this guy is a cousin of the jellyfish, which makes sense since they both give off that sting. Once again, that's a characteristic that kind of makes them related to one another. So he does have the stain, stain cells called nematocysts at the end of those tentacles that he would usually use to sting. Um, but just in our colder waters, we don't have to worry about that so much. So I'll hold him a bit closer there. So you can kind of see right there in the, oh, right there in the middle, he has tentacles in there um, and a mouth in there. But right now he's just really protecting himself. And he's actually attached to a muscle shell right now. That's what I'm holding on to here. Um, so this bottom part of their body there, they're able to stick on things, kind of move around, almost similar to a snail, I guess. Um, but he's stuck on pretty tight. So um, if I try to take him off there, I'd probably damage him. So that's why I'm just holding him by the muscle shell there. Put him back in the water there. 
And now in here, I have quite a few guys who are pretty active. And I've already, as I mentioned before, I had to split up a couple of crab fights. Um, so we do have a couple of different kinds of crabs in here, um, which are a lot of people's favorite. They're pretty active, um, pretty, pretty mean to one another, honestly, um, pretty crabby. <laughs> um, but I'll pick up the first guy here. This guy is called a rock crab. And he is the most common kind of crab that we would see along our shorelines here in, in Western Newfoundland, um, or at least he should be. Um, so he's almost like this red color. He kind of blends in with rocks, which is why he's named the rock crab. Um, this is a really small one. They do grow to be quite a bit bigger than this, but we like to show off the smaller guys in the touch tank. They're a bit more, a bit more friendly. Um, so you can see he has two claws here in the front that he's kind of has tucked into his body right now. And some wiggly legs there, he's moving around there now. There you go, that's a good picture there. And one way we identify these guys is if I hold them up very, very closely, you can see he has a bunch of ridges on each side of his eyes there on the top of his shell. So he's quite a few ridges there. And the reason why this is important is because there's now another crab that we're seeing in our waters here who is not as nice and friendly as the guy I was just holding. And he can sometimes be mistaken for this guy, which isn't great because um, we're actually trying to get this guy out of our waters. And you can see he's kind of a bully. He's already picking on the anatomy that I was just showing you. He's holding on to that muscle shell there. Um, he is quite a bully. Um, so this guy is the European green crab. And you can already see he's much more active, much more agitated that I'm holding him. Um, he's a pretty aggressive crab. And the reason we don't like this guy is because he is an invasive species, which pretty much means that um, he's not native to our waters. He wasn't originally here. Um, he would have came over in water that's held underneath the ship as larvae. So when the crabs are first born, they're in a very, very small stage um, that is kind of carried um, by water currents and stuff um, in a planktonic stage. So they're actually just like in the water column. Um, they're not on the bottom and they're very, very small. So um, people in the boat wouldn't have even known the crabs were there. And then when the boat went to a new place, that water would be pushed out and the crabs would be able to grow up there and then continue to reproduce. Um, so that's what happened. And then they just migrated up from the United States to our area. Um, they've only been on the west coast of Newfoundland here in Bombay for the past seven years or so. Um, and the reason why they're thriving here so much is because the ones that we're seeing here are actually a hybrid between that original population and ones from more Northern Europe, so like Iceland, um, places like that. So they're much more tolerant to the cold. And as I mentioned here, we do have the colder waters. Um, so because of that, they're able to thrive here, do really well here. Um, and I also mentioned that that little rock crab um, is one of the most common crabs that we see along here. I said at least she, she should be. Um, that's not so much the case anymore, unfortunately. As I mentioned, these two guys are very similar. Um, the only real difference between them is that this green crab, the invasive one, reproduces way, way quicker. So um, there's just more of them because of that. And they also will eat more variety of things. So he's pretty much competing with that rock crab, meaning he's stealing home, stealing habitats, um, and stealing food from him. Um, so now if you go out into the waters here, you'll see dozens of these bad guys and only probably two or three of the, the native good guys, which is really not great. Um, so that's one reason why there is such an issue. Um, another reason why we don't like them so much here is they're very destructive. Um, so there's a habitat that we see a lot around here in sandy intertidal areas. So those areas where creatures like to burrow. Um, and that's a habitat called eelgrass beds. Um, so eelgrass is a seagrass that actually roots down into the sand and grows. And it's a very good nursery habitat for baby fish, so juvenile fish. Um, it offers them a lot of protection and they're able to grow up and kind of not have to worry about predators so much. When that um, green crab is hunting, so I just put him down in the water again for a few minutes, but I'll pick him up again in a second. Um, but when um, he's hunting, he snips down all that grass 
um, and then just to find its food. And then those fish are left really vulnerable and they probably will be predated on and uh, won't grow up to reproduce. So then fish are impacted as well, which just really isn't great. Um, so overall, they're kind of like a perfect storm of um, invasive predators. They're actually in the top 10 most wanted invasive, pred uh, invasive creatures. Um, so overall, not great. We're really trying now to figure out the best way to get them out of our waters. Um, they don't grow to be quite as big as that rock crab does. His shell won't get too much bigger than this. I think the maximum size is 10 centimeters across. So that's really not that large. So um, there's not much meat to them. So not really an edible crab, um, like the snow crab or king crab or anything like that. They don't get to be nearly that big at all. Um, so really, we're just trying to figure out the best way to kind of control them right now, get them under control. But I mentioned those ridges on the rock crab. Um, this guy only has five on each side of his eyes there. You can see it a bit better there. He has five little ridges on each side of his eyes. So that's the best way to differentiate between those two crabs. Um, so you can really know the difference when you're, um, when you're trying to find which ones are invasive and which ones aren't. Yeah. Um, one last kind of crab we have in our intertidal zones. He's one of my favorites. He is called a decorator crab. And I'm going to pick him up here. He's very wiggly. His legs are much, much longer, as you can see. He's very active. And um, he's also kind of looks a little furry. Um, you can kind of see he's a little hairy. I'm trying not to get my laptop wet here. <laughs> um, but he's pretty furry. He has all this little algae and seaweed on his back. And he attaches that to himself, actually. Um, he has these little hairs on his back called setae. And it's almost like Velcro. And he's able to kind of pick seaweed off of things and attach it to his own back. And he does that to camouflage. So um, this guy we actually don't usually have in the touch tank either. He's in his own tank that has a bunch of bottles and things with seaweed growing on it, um, the same kind of seaweed that he has on his back. So when he's not moving, he completely blends in. And people often look into that tank and say, like, what am I looking at? It's just, just dirty bottles. And we're like, look a little closer because um, there is more in there than you think. And it's very, very cool to see. Everyone's pretty always fascinated by that one. And yeah, as I mentioned before, oh, <laughs> this is actually pretty cool to see. Things are just kind of making themselves at home here now. Um, this starfish that we're looking at before is now holding on to this ball of coral. He's hanging on to it pretty tight. He probably thought it was food or something, um, but he doesn't quite have his stomach out yet, so. Maybe we'll see if they'll push his stomach out for you guys to see. That would be pretty cool. Um, but we mentioned that eelgrass beds were a nursery habitat. And since I was just showing you that little ball of coral, I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about that. So this little ball of coral, um, it's normally a very bright pink color. And that's what it looks like when it's alive. It's what we call rhodolith. So um, again, in more tropical areas, people may be familiar with um, coral reefs, things like that. Um, this is a coral that we get in more temperate or colder waters again, um, rhodolith. And it usually looks like this with a Ooh, crabs <laughs> with a red coralline algae growing over it, almost the same color as my sweater here, or a little bit, a little bit more pink. Um, yep, yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, usually it would be in a more ball shape like this, and this will kind of roll along on the seafloor like a tumbleweed almost until it grows and grows. It accumulates sediments on the seafloor, um, so it would grow until it was large enough to kind of stay in one place. Um, and then it would grow into a really large structure we call a rotolith bed. And when that happens, um, they are also a great nursery habitat. So within all these little holes of the rotolith, little baby starfish, baby sea urchins, marine worms, any creature like that, mussels, little baby ones will live in those little holes and that's where they will grow up, where they're really safe and secure. Um, so it's a, another really important nursery habitat because it allows um, uh, juvenile creatures to grow up um, when they're not so vulnerable. And it's also very vulnerable, that rotolith is. Since it is a coral structure, it's sensitive to the same things that any coral or lots of other marine creatures are um, kind of vulnerable to. And that's climate change mostly. 
um, with climate change, we also have a phenomenon called ocean acidification. So um, ocean is usually one pH, um, and then as more carbon dioxide is in the ocean, um, the pH will change, um, it will get more acidic, and all of those corals and even crabs, things like that, they have um, a like their shells or structures are usually a basic structure of calcium carbonate and a more acidic water would actually completely destroy um, those shells or structures. Um, so they are very vulnerable because of that. And those rotolith structures are very, very slow growing. This itself um, takes up to 100 years to grow. Um, so if it is destroyed by that or by something like a fishing practice, such as dredging, where they scrape the entire ocean floor with nets, um, this would take a very long time to recover, of course, if it ever even would at this point um, with climate change happening, it may never recover. So then all those little creatures that call it home while they're growing up, they would be, they would be, they'd be homeless and um, they probably wouldn't grow up to reproduce again, so um, it wouldn't be great. So those structures really need to be protected um, for that reason, the same way that the eelgrass beds need to be protected from the green crabs because they really keep the habitats thriving, they keep biodiversity up, um, they're very important that way. We have a couple more, oh. <laughs> I was just going to say, if you have more uh, deep things you wanted to share with us, fantastic. Or we can dive in with questions soon. Whatever works for you, Willa. Yeah, I have a, just a couple more creatures that I'd like to share with you guys, and we can dive in some questions. Um, one of our creatures here, this guy, again, is normally not in the touch tank, um, but he's a smaller one, so he's usually pretty, pretty cool to hold here. So we have a little baby lobster here for you guys. <laughs> Um, so I'll hold him over here. You can see he's on defense mode right now. So he has his claws out like that. So he is a baby one. So he's quite small. Um, he would be probably a year or two years old. Um, so they do take quite a big, a long time to grow to be full size. <laughs> and he's just flicking his tail at me. Um, and that's because, as I mentioned with the crabs, they start off in a very small larval stage. Um, and I actually have some of that here to show you guys as well. So if it's able to be shown on camera, um, we had a larger lobster come to us this summer who had eggs under her tail. And while she was here, those eggs did hatch, which is really, really cool to see. So if I hold this way up here, those little guys you see floating around in there, those are baby lobsters. So they're smaller than my pinky nail and they grow up to be the size of a full size lobster, even the size of the ones that produce those ones. And she's probably about this big. She's very, very large. Um, so it's quite impressive that things that small in the ocean can survive to be full size. Um, yeah, there you go. Very, very tiny in their, in their planktonic stage. And at that size, they'll kind of float around in the water column until they eat enough to become large enough to sink to the bottom. Um, and that's when they start to look like what we would recognize as a lobster. And our last guy here that I will show you for today before we start our question period is my all-time favorite. And this here is our moon snail. So he's one of those creatures that likes to bury himself down under the sand, like I mentioned in the intertidal zone. So usually um, just walking around at the beach, you wouldn't see them too often because they're way down under the sand. And the reason why they do that is because they are searching for clams who also bury themselves down under the sand. Um, that's his favorite food. Um, so his mouth is almost like a drill and he'll drill right into that clam shell and suck the clam out and that's how he eats. So very similar to how the starfish eats in that way. And you can see just how large his foot is here and it's very slimy as well. Um, so this foot of his will absorb seawater. That's how it gets to be so much larger than a shell there. And if he really wanted to go back into his shell, he could, but you have to push all that water out of his foot first and head back into his shell. Um, so he uses this big foot to plow right down under the rocks and sand and all of that. So you don't really see them too often. So it's very neat to see, see in person. And I will put him back in and get this slime off my hands. And then if you guys have any questions, fire away.
Fantastic. Willa, I'm sorry the connection wasn't quite as good as we hoped in our, our test, but I'm glad that we were able to share some of those pictures as you were talking about all the amazing creatures there. And I want to go back before we dive in with Mr. B's class in a second for our first question. You, know, you talked about the fact that there are Arctic creatures basically trapped because they can't go into the, I guess, warmer water in the deeper part of the bay there. Like that is, can you explain a little bit more about that? Because it sounds so counterintuitive that things can't just swim wherever they want to. Absolutely, yeah. So that east arm that's super deep, um, it's about 230 meters deep. Um, the south arm is a bit more shallow at 150 meters deep. And then there's that really shallow, we call it a tickle in Newfoundland, but nobody else really refers to it as that. It's one of those unique Newfoundland sayings, um, but it's a sill. So it's a really shallow area of water um, where when those two glaciers carved out the two arms of the bay, all of that sediment um, was pushed together in the middle. Um, so that's only about 15 meters deep. And that's what keeps those really deep creatures in the east arm unable to come out of there because they can't um, get up, like they're in the really cold deep water so they wouldn't be able to travel all the way up to the shallow warmer water. It's so neat, nice. thank you so much for sharing that, Willa. Um, let's head to Benicia, California, Mr. B's class, joining us for the first time this year. Welcome in, guys. Hello. Um, how, long could it, how long can a starfish live on land? Yeah. That's a great question and one that we hear all the time. Um, so in our aquarium, we recommend holding them for like two, three minutes at a time max. However, um, in, in the natural environment, when that tide would be going in and out, they'd be able to survive um, for quite a bit um, out of the water. They're used to the tide going in and out. So um, they have adaptations to kind of, kind of, live in that environment. Um, it's kind of variable. It would it would change um, depending on the starfish, how big he was, things like that. But usually what they would do is they'd find a patch of seaweed at low tide and seaweed um, is kind of dark, cold and wet. And he'd hide in that and that would help him keep his moisture in. So hopefully he'd be able to survive until the high tide came back in and, and covered him in water again. So um, a few hours probably. Great question, guys. All right, let's head to Good Shepherd School, Ms. Benoit's class in Cordes. If you guys want to come on in, you're good to go. Hi. Hi. We had two questions. Our first one, how do we see urchins move? How do they move, Willa? That's a great question. So, as I mentioned, one of those things that relates them to starfish is that they have those same little suction cups or tube feet that we saw all over his body. So the second I pick him up, he pulls all those in so he can't see them right now. Uh, but they're like these purple strings that will come off of his body and he's able to use them like suction cups and kind of, kind of suction his way around. Um, he also is able to use these spines a little bit. He can move them a bit and he can kind of feel his way around with those a bit as well. I got this uh, a sort of up close picture of some starfish tube feet. I don't know if for anyone who's ever had the chance to see or hold an animal with tube feet, it's such a surreal and a strange feeling. Um, they're really, really unique and special. So I'm really glad we got that question. Awesome, guys. All right, Mr. Silva's class uh, joining us today. Welcome in, guys. And uh, come on in and, and take us away. Unmute your mic and you're good to go. Hello, 7-8 Virtual School. <laughs> but unmute. There we go. <laughs> More fun that way, I find. Hi. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Uh, we have Jenna who has a question. Uh, well, we have two questions. If yes. We can come back as well. Yeah. Go ahead, Jenna. So my question is, do any of your sea creatures ever try to eat each other? Yes, the classic <laughs> aquarium question. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I'm actually watching a cra the green crab, that aggressive guy. He's a big bully, and he's probably the one who tries to eat things most, honestly. But yeah, um, we kind of try to keep things as close to uh, life as possible in our aquarium. So um, for the most part, um, we keep things well fed so they don't try to eat each other. Um, but um, if things do go after each other, we kind of just let it happen sometimes just because that's what they'd be doing in their in their natural home anyway. So we want to make them feel as comfortable as possible. So absolutely, they, they do eat each other sometimes. <laughs> what you're saying is you want to make the collective ecosystem feel as comfortable as possible, but presumably the animal being eaten isn't so jazzed about this idea. But well, well you can cover that later. Great question, guys. Uh, Rama Junior Academy, Savannah, Georgia. You guys have a question for us? Come on up, Mr. Mitchell's class and go for it. Hi, guys. Hey, R.J. Hi, Matt. Hello. 
Hey. Hello. Oh. Um, where do um like where is the mom? Do you know where the mama lobster is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have all these baby lobsters. Is mama ever with them? Does she take care of them? What's the deal? Yeah, yeah. so creatures in the ocean don't really have like a big sense of family for the most part. Um, so we do have mama lobster here in the aquarium still. Um, we will be releasing her um, in a, just a, a month or so now. Um, but um, so she had probably tens of thousands of those babies. And since they're so small, they kind of just drift away from her and grow up all on their own. Um, she doesn't really take care of them or anything like that, which is why she has to have so many because there is a very low survival rate in the ocean. So out of those tens of thousands of eggs that she had, probably only 10 or so will grow up to be like a full size lobster. Wow. And this is something that, uh, again, there's sort of two distinct groups of creatures in the world. There are creatures like people that have like one or a few babies and sort of take a lot of care of them and raise them up to they're older. And there's some that just, you know, 20,000 babies and hope for the best and see how it goes. We see this as seahorses too, where you'll have like a thousand offspring and maybe one or two will actually end up becoming an adult. So great question, guys. Also, the best dressed class we've had so far in our first two weeks is Rema Junior Academy. So way to go, guys. Um, Mr. Shabbat's class heading to Chalk River. Welcome in six through eight. Hey guys. Hi. Hi. So the question is, are, are, sea, are sea urchins kind of like amphibians or something? Ooh. Um, that's a good question. Not quite. Um, so they are they are a complete marine creature. They're what we call an invertebrate. Uh, an echinoderm, yeah, um, but overall an invertebrate. Pretty much, well, all the creatures we looked at today actually are what we call invertebrates, um, which means they don't have a spine, um, they don't have a brain, they don't really have any of those um, structures that we would usually, that we, we have or other, other mammals have. Um, most of them don't even have eyes, so um, they're very unique in that way. I, I like a good way of thinking about it for your class is you are much closer to a frog than a frog is to a sea urchin. Uh, so we're, we're much closer. A frog is closer to a fish, it's closer to a snake, it's closer to a bird than it is to anything like a sea urchin or anything that we got the chance to explore today. This is a really quite unique group of creatures. Again, we talked about uh, pentaradial symmetry. So people are symmetrical down the middle and most vertebrates are. We have one side that's the same, the other side is the same. With some of these creatures, it's five-way symmetry, which is really weird to think about. It's almost like an alien type of creature on planet Earth, uh, but very, very fantastic. Great question, guys. All right, Winnipeg, Mr. Klassen's class. I know you've got two devices on, so you might have an echo. I hope you do not. Hi, guys. Do you have a question for us? I do. I have one. Yes, when you yeah. opened up, Willa, when you took over the place, what's going on? What did you bring in? Good question. Yeah. So what's really cool about this place is we're only open seasonally. So um, every spring we come and we have to collect all the creatures ourselves or we have scuba divers help us too. And then at the very end of the season, so now in about a month or so, you guys might actually be the, the last group to see all these creatures, which is really cool, um, before we release them back to the ocean. But this summer, um, the first creature that we had, hmm, let me think for a second. I think it probably would have been a sculpin fish. And I think that's what it was last year too. They're a very common fish that we see in the Newfoundland waters here. They're called a the sculpin. They're not very cute, um, but <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> our, our understatement of the day, I'll bring up a picture of sculpin fish in a minute. They're, 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 they have a look, they have a vibe <laughs> they've got going on. Uh, Willa, are you good for another round of questions with all our classes? We got about our, our six groups with us. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. B's class, back to California, and you're good to go. Hi, guys. Um, are sea cucumbers dangerous for diving? Ooh, are they dangerous? 
Not in the slightest, actually. Um, they're probably one of the friendliest creatures that um, are around, same with the starfish. Um, so they don't even eat other creatures. Well, I guess technically they do. They're what we call um, filter feeders. So they eat plankton, so those little microscopic plants, the animals in the water. So they wouldn't even eat like the creatures that, that we, we looked at today. They wouldn't eat any of those guys. They're very kind. Um, yeah, they, they don't really harm anything. <laughs> I do want to okay. highlight something about sea cucumbers, that when I was the age of these kids, it was my, one of my favorite facts I ever learned about a creature in the ocean. So sometimes when predators come up to a sea cucumber to try and eat it, its strategy of defense is to like throw up its organs at them and then go away. So imagine if like a tiger was bounding through the bush queue and you just threw your stomach at it and your liver and then ran away. It's really gross and really strange, but they can regrow those organs, which is really fascinating and again we, we can't regrow organs we can slightly heal some of them if they have light damage but can you even imagine something like that it's so awesome all right uh Cordis, good shepherd come on back in how many animals do you have in your aquarium yeah. that's a good question and one that we have tried to answer um we tried to do attendance one time and go around and um, count all the animals, but we just, we couldn't do it. There's so many. We have um, probably dozens of starfish, dozens of urchins, um, dozens of fish. And then when you really think about it, um, all that plankton in the water, right? Like those are creatures too. Um, they're microscopic. We can't even see them, but um, there's millions of those guys. So it's, um, it's quite impossible to know. <laughs> What we're going to do is next year we'll have the kids head to Newfoundland and then they get to see how incredible the place is and then they'll help you count, okay? That's our, our deal. We're going to try and make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Silva, 7-8 Virtual School. Come on in, guys. Hey. Uh, hi. Uh, Gabriel, would you like to ask your question? Hey, Gabriel. Uh, are sand dollars just flat sea urchins? Yes. Next question. <laughs> That's a good question. And I mean... Pretty much. <laughs> they are in the same thing, like we mentioned. Um, so this is a sand dollar, and yes, he is flat. Um, the difference would be he doesn't really eat um, seaweed or anything like that. What he would eat was just like little little particles out of the sand and his little mouth in the bottom there. But pretty much, like besides that, like they're very similar um, in the way they move and the way that they, they live their life. I uh, I hope at some point in your lives you get the chance to go to a coast and see sand dollar skeletons and sea urchin skeletons. And you can look these up too. I'll try and bring up a picture in a minute. Uh, but they, they look basically a sand dollar skeleton looks like a flattened version of the sea urchin one, which just sort of like expand the middle. It's like a popcorn bag. Uh, that's my weird analogy of the day. <laughs> All right. Savannah, Georgia, Rama Junior Academy. Welcome back in, guys. Hey. Oh, oh. <laughs> how big can a blue crab get? Uh, a, blue, a blue crab? I am not sure on that. We don't get the blue crabs here so much, so I'm not quite as familiar with them. Um, so that's a good question that um, I'll have to look up the answer to. How about the big, the big ones that you were sharing with us? How big, like, so you had a pretty sizable crab in your hand, but are, do they ever get to be like this big or never? Um, for some of them, they get to be a bit bigger. So the rock crab um, will grow to be probably like this big. I think probably like closer to like, 50 centimeters, something like that. Um, that green crab will only grow to be 10 centimeters. The one I showed is probably about as big as he gets. The bigger crabs we get here are the snow crabs, which are ones that are um, eaten too. So there's a big fishery for those ones here in Newfoundland. Um, and they can grow to be um, quite large, probably like creatures. This um, big, large legs. <laughs> Fantastic. We're going to head to Mr. Shadow's class in just a second. I want to share the sand dollar skeleton now just for our student uh, in Mr. Silva's class for Gabriel and then our sea urchin skeleton. All right. We'll bring that guy up and you guys can get a sense of this. So just wider, bigger. I I've always thought sea urchin skeletons were one of my very favorite things in all of nature. They look so elegant. They look like an art piece almost. Um, very, very cool if you get the chance to hold one at an aquarium or in the wild. Uh, Mr. Shadows class, Chalk River, and then we're heading back to Mr. Classen in Winnipeg. But come on in uh, in Ontario, guys. Hey. How long do starfish live for? Ooh. That's one of my favorite questions to answer, actually. Um, what's really cool about starfish is they can pretty much live forever in ideal conditions. Um, so they don't really have any predators. Nothing likes to eat starfish. There's not much to, to eat to them. They wouldn't taste very good to anything. Um, so because of that, um, the only thing that really impacts them 
is water quality. So if there's changes in water temperature, stuff like that, that can stress them out. Um, but since um, I didn't mention this, I guess, but I guess it is kind of known fact that if they lose their legs, um, they can regrow their legs and the leg that they lose can grow into a whole new starfish too. So that's another reason that um, they don't really have a lifespan. They can live like close to a hundred years, which is really, really neat. Very cool. And there's so many different kinds of them. I think a lot of people think starfish, they think something about this big. There are tiny starfish, skinny starfish. There are starfish with 16 legs. There are giant, like six foot starfish. So uh, one of the coolest places actually we've seen this, there's a little tiny one. How cute is that? Um, we've had Antarctic researchers show the starfish in the bottom of the Antarctic waters and they're gigantic and so, so fascinating. So I really encourage you to look up uh, some of those almost 2000 different kinds of starfish in the world. All right, Mr. Klaus in Winnipeg, to wrap us up with one final question. Can you not? Can you not? Can you not? What's the deadliest sea creature you have? The deadliest sea creature, <laughs> I, well, I would say, um, right now, I would say it would be our wolf fish, um, although I don't want to say that because it's a misconception that they're, they're aggressive. Um, so they're actually a really shy, docile creature. However, when they're threatened, uh, they do have these really, really sharp teeth um, and they could give a pretty bad bite and they have been known to do that. Um, so for that reason, I would say him reluctantly. <laughs> reluctantly. We don't want to perpetuate the myth that wolf fish are out to get you because they do look really sinister, but they're generally gentle. In theory, they have the potential to be the most dangerous. How about that? Exactly. <laughs> more, more than the starfish. The sea cucumber is not coming for the throat, ever. That will never happen, as long as we do. Well, well, thank you so much for all of this. Uh, what a pleasure to have the chance to chat with so many classes. Uh, and so, I, again, I just want to encourage our groups, uh, learn about Newfoundland. Learn about Western Newfoundland. Check out the Bombay Marine Station. I'll make sure all of our classes have the link to keep that uh, excitement going. And if you can't get up to where we are, head to your own local aquarium. See if there's ways to learn about all the local species that live near you, whether you're on a coast or a lake or a river. Water bodies are all ultimately connected. We can find a lot of some really, really cool stuff by just taking that extra second to be mindful about what lives near us. So Willa, uh, as you will now know, because this is your first broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. And so Mr. B's class, Good Shepherd, Arama Jr., Mr. Silva, Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Klassen, come on in, unmute your mic. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>